Hello, welcome to The Opinionistics. I'm your host, John Mayalone. In this episode, no co host because, again, reasons. Introducing from Chicago, currently in Colorado, Terry Tucker. John, thanks for having me on. I'm really looking forward to talking with you today. Me too. So, what is it you do for a living? What is it that I do for a living? I have a... Um motivational speaking business. Uh, I also write, write articles. I've written one book. I'm in the process of starting uh, another book. So I, I do that. I'm also a pretty much a full-time cancer warrior. I was diagnosed with a rare form of melanoma back in 2012. Was told I'd be lucky to live two years and lo and behold, 11 and a half years later, I'm still here. So I, I try to find purpose in life and I take that purpose and enjoy it as much as I possibly can. Mm, very good. So what inspired you to take the path that you've been going on for so many years? I really think it was my, my father. When I graduated from college, uh, back in 1982, gives you an idea of how old I am. Um, my father was dying of cancer and he had end stage breast cancer at that point in time. And they really didn't know how to treat a man with breast cancer. And so they, they pretty much told him to go home and die. And he lived another three and a half years. And I believe he did because he had a purpose. He had something to focus on other than his cancer. He was, he was in real estate as a job. He loved real estate. He actually worked up till two weeks before he died. And I sort of tucked that in the back of my mind that when it was my turn in the barrel, so to speak, that I needed to, I needed to have a purpose. I needed to have a focus other than my disease. And so I, I'm a little bit limited. Part of my cancer journey has involved the amputation of my foot in 2018 and the amputation of my leg in 2020. So I'm a, a little bit uh, mobility challenged, but I, I've enjoyed the ability to get out on podcasts. I've, I've been a guest on well over 600 podcasts all around the world, uh, meeting great people, sharing what I've learned during my journey and also writing. So I, I have found a way to incorporate things I'm good at and that I enjoy and that I love into my daily routine with the limitations that I have right now. Mm. Okay, nice. So how many books have you written so far? I, I've written one book that's been published. I've written several other books. One of the jobs that I had in my life when uh, my wife and I have one child, a daughter, when our daughter was young as I was a police officer and I used to write stories to her on the off chance that one night I didn't come home from my job. And I eventually had all these stories that you could potentially say is a book. And I gave it to her. I said, if you want to publish this, go right ahead. If you want to keep it for yourself, feel free to do that as well. Uh, I also wrote another book, uh, a huge book. It's, it's like 400, 500 pages about my cancer journey. And I tried at one point to get that published. But what I was told was publishing companies aren't interested in publishing a book about cancer unless you're either A, famous, which I'm not, or B, have a large following, which I don't. So I, I made an, uh, an overture into that. It didn't work out, but I moved on to the book I eventually had published. And like I said, I'm, I'm also working on another book right now. Nice. Very good. What was life for you growing up? Life was great growing up. I am uh, the oldest of three boys. As you mentioned, I was, I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago. You can't tell this from, from my voice, but I'm six foot eight inches tall. And I actually went to college on a basketball scholarship I have a, a brother, another brother who's six foot seven, who was a pitcher for the University of Notre Dame here in the United States. And then I have another brother who's six foot six, who was drafted into the National Basketball Association, professional basketball, 
here in the States. And then my dad was six foot five. So we used to joke that if you sat behind our family in church growing up, not a prayer's chance you were going to see anything that was going on in front of you. But my my parents really showed us the, the importance, the value of family, of loving each other, of caring for each other, of supporting each other. And they used to do what I called divide and conquer parenting, where I would have a game on a particular night at a particular time. And my brother would have a practice at the exact same time, the exact same day. And so my parents were like, okay, I, my dad would go with me and my mom would go with my brother. And our whole life revolved around athletics, sports that we were involved in. And it was, it was just, it was a coalescing uh, thing that, that got our family together. We were, we were very sports minded and, and my parents supported us in the things that we did. And it was just, it was, a, it was just a great time to grow up. I, I still am very close with my brothers. Unfortunately, my father has passed away, but my mother's 88 years old and is still with us. So uh, family is incredibly important and it was great growing up. Wow. I can see that. Where do you see yourself? 20 years from now. I, I don't mean to be flippant on that, but more than likely dead. <laughs> I, 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 I kind of joke about it, but um, uh, my, my disease continues to consume my body. Um, and it, it's, it's not something I, I dwell on. And when I found out I had, I was going to have my leg amputated and, and I, I still have tumors in my lungs, which I'm, I'm treated for every three weeks at the hospital. I went with my wife to the mortuary and to the cemetery and to the church and actually planned my funeral. And because I go on podcasts like yours and, and talk about motivation and the need to keep moving forward or speak to groups in person, I actually got some brushback from people who suggested that somehow planning my funeral was in some way defeatist. And I had to remind those folks that the last time I checked, we're all going to die as as far as I know, nobody's working on a cure for life right now. John, every one of us is going to die, but not every one of us is really going to live. And I, I heard a Native American Blackfoot proverb years ago that I absolutely love. And it goes like this. When you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a way so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. That's what I want. That's what I'm looking to do. Don't get me wrong. I'm not hate, looking to hasten my demise at all. But death is not nearly as scary for me because I believe I lived the purposes that I was put on this earth to do. Yes, absolutely. If you were given 500 acres of land, what would you use that land for? That's a great question. Um I was given 500 acres of land. I would probably farm it in all honesty. I would probably grow, grow things. I, 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 that's kind of an appealing thought to, to sort of have land. And I, I live in a city, I've lived in cities most of my life. I've never lived in really rural areas. And the thought of just kind of, you know, having some land and having a, a home on that land and sitting on the front porch and, and just contemplating life and, and, and enjoying the simplicity of it just has an appeal when you said that. So I would, I would probably, I, I wouldn't obviously farm it, but I would probably hire it out to be farmed and, and grow something that could benefit or, or nurture other people and just enjoy the, the calm and the serenity of, of having that much land. Mm, yes, absolutely. Have you heard of a drink called banana friche? I have not. That's all right. I get that a lot. So anyway, if you were given a, to do a presentation for 40 minutes without any preparation, what would it be? What would I talk about? Um, I would probably play to my strengths and talk about what I've experienced and what I know. I've, I've done a lot of things in my life. One of the things I did was I was a SWAT team hostage negotiator. So there's a, there's a lot of, depending on who the audience was, if it was a, 
a business community or a company. I might talk about the application of what I learned as a SWOT negotiator and how they can apply those, those skills, those techniques to their business, to selling, to making deals, to negotiating. Um, if it was more of a general audience, I'd, I'd probably talk about what I've learned over 11 and a half years of battling cancer. I mean, it would, I've always believed that when you give a talk, it, it should be something that you're, you're giving to the audience, that, that they find value in it. It's not about you. It's not about what you're getting. It's about what you're giving to that audience. So depending on who the audience is, might talk about SWAT negotiation. I might talk about what I've learned during my cancer journey. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? That's a that's another tough question. I, I've I've never really lived outside of the United States. I, I've been very fortunate in that regard. I've lived many places in the United States, many different cities in that. Um, I think the most beautiful, the, the, the place we lived with the best weather, with some of the nicest people, was Santa Barbara, California. It, it's just, it's right on the ocean. It's got high cliffs and, and sort of hills and mountains. It, it's, it's the best of, of sort of both worlds. I enjoy the ocean, but I enjoy the mountains more. I, my wife and I live in Colorado here in the United States, which is very very mountainous. It's in the Rocky Mountains. And uh, I, I love it. I love getting up. We have a beautiful view at the back of our home of the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. So I, I never take that for granted. I, I, I look at that every day as, boy, I get to wake up and see this. So without really knowing any other place around the world, I, I like I said, I've, I've done podcasts all over the world, Africa, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, uh, Canada. I, I, I've, I've had the opportunity to sort of vicariously learn about those places through my podcasting journey, but I, I guess I would have to say Santa Barbara, California. Mm, very good. Would you rather never use social media again or never watch another movie or TV show again? Um, I don't watch TV very often, in all honesty. My wife watches the news occasionally, but I can't tell you the last time I've, I've watched television. Um, I, I mean, social media, I, I'm old enough to remember when there was no social media, when there were no cell phones and, and computers and internet and things like that, that, that we all, I think, take for granted now. So I'm, I'm old enough to remember when we didn't have it. And, and times were certainly simpler, but I think the, the opportunity that social media gives us to, to learn about almost anything that we have an interest in, whether it's, you know, quantum physics or how to bake a cake, it, it's all available on social media. It's all available on the internet. So I guess I would, I don't know. That's, a, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I guess, obviously my, my actions have said, I don't, I don't watch TV or, or movies very often. So I guess I would go with the TV and movie uh, answer to that question. Okay. Very nice. What should they teach in high school, but they don't? How to live. I, I mean, we spend so much time focused on math and science and, and English. And, 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 we, and we should. We absolutely should do that. But we don't teach life skills. When I was in college or when I was in high school, they they offered courses on, uh, and again, I'm going to date myself, you know, how to use a typewriter. Now we have keyboards. Uh, they, they offered courses on financial management, how to write a check, how to invest, how to get a loan, things like that. They offered courses on auto mechanics, how to change a tire, how to change your oil, how to do, do things like that that I don't think the younger generation understands or knows how to do. I think they're, you know, how to cook, how, how to just basically coordinate your life that I don't think we, we, we teach that in school. I don't think we teach it in our families that much either. And it's, it's up to a lot of people to figure out how to do some of these things, how to, how to just have some basic life skills. So I, I think we need to spend, yes, time on math, science, reading, things like that. Yes, we should. But we also 
need to spend, I think, a little bit more time on life skills that are more practical to everyday living. Yes, absolutely. What improved your life quality so much you wish you did it sooner? This is going to sound so contrary to, to I, I think, probably answers you've gotten. But I, I'm going to say cancer. Uh, cancer has made me a better human being. I, I think you really don't know yourself until you've been tested by some form of adversity in your life. And certainly cancer has done that for me. My father dying at a very uh, early age, very young age, did that for me as well. Um, but I, I, I don't I don't know if I would go back and redo it. If you said, hey, can you, if you had a do over, would you go back and say you never got cancer? And I don't know if I would. And I know that sounds kind of strange, but it really is, it's made me a better human being. I think when you, when you can't do the things that you were good at, you, you, you find a way to do the things that are important. And I think I've done that. I've, I've said, you know, Yes, I was an athlete. Yes, I've done those. Those were great things. Those were great times in my life. But were they really important? And I think now that I've got cancer and 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 more than likely coming towards the end of my life, you focus on the things that really are important, like family, friends, faith, love, goodness, and, and things like that. A lot of the things we get all riled up about and have stress over really aren't that important in life. And I. I think when you get a terminal or, or chronic illness, you tend to focus on what really is important in life. Mm, yes, of course. What song is a 10 out of 10, yet hardly anyone has ever heard of it? What song? Huh? Um, so there was... There's a, a piece of literature about Cyrano de Bergerac um, that probably people have not heard of. And that literature went on to become a play called The Man of La Mancha. And that play has a song in it that I, that I absolutely love and I think has a tremendous message. And it's called The Impossible Dream. And it talks about in that, in that song how you know, you, you do things, you know, to, to fight for the right and, 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 and do things in your life that if you do, you know that when you're laid to your rest, that your heart will be peaceful and calm. And I, and I, I love that song. So I, w without anything else popping into my head, I'm going to say the impossible dream from the man from La Macha. Hmm. Yes, I can see that. What is your favorite quote? Boy, I have so many of them. Um, I'll give you two, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, the first one is from a writer by the name of Ernest Hemingway, who said, life breaks everyone. And afterwards, many are stronger at the broken places. I, I love that quote. And then uh, there was a basketball coach when I was growing up at the University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA, who had, I think, the best definition of success that I've ever heard. And keep in mind, this was probably the most successful basketball coach at the time. And here was his definition of success. Success is peace of mind, which is a direct result of self-satisfaction in knowing that you did the best to become the best that you're capable of becoming. And so here's this great coach winning all these basketball games, but if you listen to that definition, nowhere in there does it say anything about winning. It basically says, have you done everything you can to get the most out of the potential that you have in your life? And if you can, then in his definition, that is success. Wow, brilliant. What do you get every time you go shopping uh what do i get every time i go shopping I, I i don't go shopping that's the problem <laughs> i'm in a wheelchair and that so i my wife does does most of our shopping I, the shopping i do when i go when i when i shop which is online 
99% of the time are, are usually gifts for other people in some way. Our, our, our daughter, our, my brothers, my wife, things like that. So I, I don't really have one specific thing, but in, a, in an overall general look, that they would be Christmas gifts, birthday gifts, some gift of some kind. Okay, nice, nice. How did you spend your last birthday? How did I spend my last birthday? Um, <laughs> I spent my last birthday in a uh, in the hospital getting infusion treatment for my cancer. Um, we celebrated the following week when I was a little bit more with it. Uh, it was just my wife and myself. Our daughter is uh, is in the military and is in another part of the country. So it was just the two of us, which was was fine with me. It, it was a, a quiet, um, meaningful, sort of relaxing birthday that I that I enjoyed very much. Nice. If someone wrote a book about you, what do you think his title would be? Boy, that's a great question. Um, what would its title be? I, I think it. I, I'm not sure if I could come up with a title, but I think it would have. It, it would have the word resilient in it somewhere that I, I just, I'm not a person to quit. I'm not a person to complain, I'm not a com person to back down. I, I, I try to look at life as I, I, maybe I'm scared about this, uh, but I'm going to do it anyway. And, and I'm, whenever I, especially when I speak to younger people, I always tell them if there's, if there's something in your heart, something in your soul, that you believe you're supposed to do, but it scares you, go ahead and do it. Because at the end of your life, the things that you are going to regret are not going to be the things you did. They're going to be those things you didn't do. And by then it's going to be too late to go back and do them. So I would hope that somewhere in that title would be the word resilience. I would hope it would be something that I, I went after things that I enjoyed, that I was good at. I played to my strengths. I used my unique gifts and talents, and you, you, can, you can use all those words and try to figure out a title, but I, I will leave it at that. Mm, nice, nice. Where was the longest line you have ever waited in? Oh, it would probably be at Disneyland uh, in, in Florida uh, when we were, uh, it's been a while since I've been there, but when, when we were young, just the, the, the hour wait for you know, a, a two minute ride or something like that. It would probably have to be somewhere like a, an amusement park, like Disneyland. Hmm. Interesting. If you could travel back in time, which decade would you want to live in? Um, I, I loved growing up in the 1970s. But I, I don't know if I would want to live back in time. I mean, it was a, it was a great time. Like I said, we I came from a great family, had great friends, and it was just a, a wonderful time in my life. But I mean, the, you know, every decade has advances. Every decade has advances in medicine, has advances in technology, has advances in, in education and, and things. And we, we know more. We get better. And I, I like that. I like the let's not look backwards other than to learn from our mistakes, but let's move forward. I mean, we can't go back and change the future, but we can certainly apply the things that we learned in the future to not making those same mistakes. Unfortunately, I, I, I'm not sure we're very smart in that regard. We, we seem to make the same mistakes over and over and over. And, and, and sometimes when I talk with business people, I always tell them that it's like, go back and research things. You know, what you're trying to do is not, more than likely the first time something like this has been done. So go back and find out the mistakes that people made in the past, maybe not with this exact same thing, and try not to replicate those mistakes. Try to learn from them and, and do a better job of implementing your idea. So I, I love living in the 70s. So if I had to answer your question, I would say the 1970s. Fabulous. What were the silliest things you believed as a child? Um, believed in Santa Claus, believed in the Easter Bunny. I, I remember we, at one point, we lived in Atlanta, Georgia, here in the U.S. And um, Atlanta has a very mild climate. It doesn't get real cold, gets very hot in the summer and things like that. But 
we had a fireplace and my dad uh, at Easter time used baby powder and made what we thought as little kids were, were bunny tracks in the house that the, the, the Easter bunny had come down the chimney and had walked across the family room floor and had hidden Easter baskets and things like that. And we were like, you know, we came down the next morning and, Oh my gosh, we got Easter baskets. This is great. And, and, and not logically thinking, why would the Easter bunny make white footprints when there was no snow and he came through the chimney, which there would be, you know, soot and things like that. We, we, we just never questioned, you know, we, we weren't smart enough. We weren't, uh, you know, mostly intelligent enough to question those things, but we thought that was the greatest thing in the world. Look at the Easter bunny left tracks on our, in our house. We called all our friends over and like, Hey, look, the Easter bunny was here and things like that. I, I mean, the things that you, you get joy out of when you're a child, when, when you're innocent and things like that are, are just, even though they may not be true. I mean, they just, they leave a positive impact on your heart. I think it's, I think those things, some people are like, Oh, Hey, I'd never tell my kid that the Santa Claus is real or anything like that. I, I, I get that. But I, I, my wife and I always told our daughter that Santa was real and we, we enjoyed her having the fantasy of, of a good person, of a loving person that gives gifts, that gives of him or herself. And I think that's that's an important lesson for us to teach younger people as they grow up. Yes, indeed. What current trend do you hope will go on for a long time? Oh, boy. Hmm. John, I don't know. I, I mean, there's nothing coming to my mind. I, I mean, I hope the knowledge that we are gaining um, from, from studying things, from, from medicine, from astronomy, from uh, so, sociology, philosophy, things like that. I hope, I hope we always have that knowledge, that, that yearning for additional knowledge to get better, to improve, to know more. And, and it was, you know, when I, when I was a kid, a teacher would assign a, a paper or a project. You had to go to the library. You, you had to go and, and get out encyclopedias or books or periodicals and, and research and things like that. I mean, now we have that with the click of a mouse. So the, the ability to learn, the ability to grow, the ability to improve our lives, I hope we never lose that. But in doing so, I think we've gotten to a point where we've, we tend to look at other people that don't agree with us as somehow bad. That if you don't share the same philosophy, the same opinions as me, you're a bad person. When did that happen? I mean, when did we go from saying, okay, we may not agree on certain things that may be politically motivated or whatever, but that doesn't make you a bad person. You can still be my friend. We can still hang out together. And somehow, certainly here in the United States, I don't know if you you experienced this in the UK, but the same thing of, of, of looking at people and saying, well, if you don't agree with me 100% on this thing, then somehow you're a bad human being. And, and that's just, that's not good. We, if COVID taught us anything, it's how much we need each other, how much that, you know, we, we're better together than we are separately. You know, during COVID, alcoholism rates went up, drug abuse rates went up, domestic violence rates went up. We need to be together. We need each other. And somehow I find ourselves pulling, pulling away and sort of entrenching into certain camps that I don't want to do that. I, I, want, I want to understand where other people are coming from. I don't want to ostracize them because they may not agree with me on a certain point. Yes, couldn't, couldn't agree more. And that is all we have for this episode. It was great having you on, Terry, talking about your works as an author and also a speaker at some point and everything else. It's been great. Well, John, thanks for having me on. I, I really enjoyed talking with you today. Me too. And until next time, stay opinionated. <laughs>